Who killed a Cro-Magnon who lived in Italy 17,000 years ago? Let's find out. In the shadows of the southern alpine foothills of northern Italy, inside a shallow grave beneath a rock shelter known as Riparo Tagliente, a man once lay undisturbed for nearly 17,000 years. His life, death and rediscovery would come to reveal one of the most haunting and earliest known cases of violent intergroup conflict in prehistoric Europe. This man, known today as Tagliente I or Tagliente Man, not only bore the genetic signature of a population that would later dominate the gene pool of post-glacial Europe, but he also carried in his bones the story of his untimely death at the hands of rival humans. Tagliente Man's partial skeleton was unearthed in the Riparo Tagliente rock shelter. For decades, his remains sat in collections largely forgotten, until a resurgence of interest in ancient DNA and trauma analysis led scientists to take a closer look. His preserved lower limbs, femur and tibia, showed peculiar incisions that would soon tell a much darker tale than anyone had previously imagined. Recent 3D microscopy and scanning electron microscopy analysis revealed that these incisions were projectile impact marks caused by flint-tipped weapons thrown with considerable force. Some projectiles had struck him from behind, others from the front, one had landed perilously close to his femoral artery, the fatal blow. The absence of healing around the wounds confirms that he died shortly after the attack. Researchers concluded that Tagliente Man's death was not the result of an accident or animal attack. It was targeted violence, a form of human-on-human -human conflict. What kind of accident does this? asked bioarchaeologist Vitale Sparacello. It was probably some kind of an ambush. The lesions were not butchery marks, nor signs of ritual defleshing, but consistent with the types of wounds inflicted by fast-moving projectiles used in intergroup conflict during the late Upper Paleolithic. The multiple directions of the wounds indicate either more than one assailant or a coordinated ambush. This is among the earliest direct evidence of humans killing one another at a distance using weapons of war. The attackers were another group of hunter-gatherers competing for territory as the glaciers receded and new land opened after the last glacial maximum Europe. Taglienti Man was a young adult male crow magnon, between 22 and 30 years old when he died. Although initially considered distinct from a mandible found at the same site, advanced paleogenomic analysis revealed that they were, in fact, the same individual. The differing radiocarbon dates between the two skeletal elements, one from the femur and the other from a molar, were attributed to varying dietary signals and minor contamination from conservation treatments. Tagliente Man's genome places him within the Villa Bruna genetic cluster, which arose in Italy shortly after the last glacial maximum. This cluster is distinct from the earlier Gravettian Vestonice cluster and shows strong genetic affinities to the Balkans. His maternal Y chromosome belonged to haplogroup I2, a lineage that rose to prominence among European hunter-gatherers and was especially common during the Mesolithic. His maternal mitochondrial DNA was assigned to haplogroup U2, a lineage that also proliferated during the Paleolithic and was common in Upper Paleolithic Italy. He bore no relationship to Ozzi the Iceman, who was also killed in the Italian Alps by the Arrow some 12,000 years later, the term Cro-Magnon remains a valid and scientifically useful designation because it refers specifically to a population of early modern humans in Ice Age Europe whose skeletal remains exhibit robust features that distinguish them from both Neanderthals and later Homo sapiens populations. The decision by some anthropologists to abandon the term was rooted in an outdated belief in the strict replacement model, that modern humans were entirely separate species that did not interbreed with Neanderthals. This view has since been overturned by overwhelming genetic evidence showing that interbreeding did occur. By discarding the term Cro-Magnon, researchers erased a critical label for the distinctive early European Upper Paleolithic population that helps us trace the hybridization and diversification of modern humans. Reinstating the term acknowledges both the historical significance of these fossils and the complex evolutionary tapestry that shaped modern human ancestry. 
The Villa Bruna cluster represents a significant demographic turnover in post-glacial Europe. After the coldest phase of the Ice Age, around 21,000 years ago, southern and eastern populations carrying this ancestry moved into the Italian peninsula and replaced or absorbed previous Gravettian groups. The genetic trail indicates a corridor running from the Balkans into northern Italy and eventually across Western Europe. The arrival of this group likely coincided with profound cultural changes such as shifts in lithic technology and burial customs. Although low coverage genome data limits the certainty of specific phenotype reconstructions, individuals from the Villa Bruna cluster, such as Tagliente Man, typically carried a mix of ancestral and derived pigmentation traits. Based on related genomes from the same cluster and time period, it's highly probable that Tagliente Man had light-coloured eyes, possibly blue or green, and dark hair, with skin pigmentation intermediate between that of earlier Gravettian Europeans and lighter-skinned Mesolithic populations. The SLC-24A5 and SLC-45A2 alleles associated with light skin pigmentation were not yet widespread, although they begin to show up in Epigravetian individuals. His ancestry also suggests a reduced Neanderthal component compared to older European populations. Tagliente man's bones preserve evidence of his diet through stable isotope analysis. Compared to contemporaries, he consumed a substantial amount of aquatic protein from freshwater fish. This contrasts with the largely terrestrial diet of other Epigravetian individuals, including earlier Upper Paleolithic humans. His consumption of aquatic foods may have been due to seasonal or environmental factors or reflect specific subsistence strategies used by his group. Interestingly, this dietary signature also helped clarify apparent inconsistencies in radiocarbon dating. While one sample dated him slightly younger than another, the discrepancy was not due to the presence of two individuals, but rather to variations in the parts of the skeleton sampled and their collagen turnover rates. The identity of Tagliente Man's attackers remains a mystery, but given the genomic and archaeological context, Researchers believe the violence stemmed from intergroup conflict during a period of territorial expansion and migration. As glaciers retreated and fertile valleys reopened, human groups began recolonizing the Alps and competing for access to game, water sources and shelter. The technology used, flint-tipped projectile weapons, strongly suggests organized violence and possibly planned raiding or ambush scenarios. Given the genetic homogeneity of Epigravetian groups across Italy, the attackers may have belonged to a similar gene pool, but a different band. Differences in territory, access to highland hunting grounds or personal disputes could have escalated into violence. Alternatively, remnants of Gravitian groups, possibly pushed to marginal areas by the incoming Epigravitian wave, may have resisted displacement. While there's limited genetic evidence of coexistence, archaeological layers suggest that some Gravitian technologies lingered. This could mean the attack was part of a larger pattern of demographic replacement and conflict, a clash between new and old inhabitants of the Italian peninsula. While the attacker's genetic identity cannot be directly known, the context of projectile trauma, the lack of healing, and the targeting of major arteries all point to deliberate, practiced violence, a warning of the darker side of prehistoric human expansion. Tagliente Man's burial was careful, even ceremonial, he was laid supine in a shallow pit, with his arms outstretched and his legs covered by slabs of stone. One of the stones bore a carved image, what appears to be a lion and an auroch's horn. Red ochre and a pierced shell were also found near the body. Despite the violent nature of his death, his community ensured a respectful burial. This suggests that Tagliente Man held a valued role, possibly as a hunter or warrior. The presence of animal symbolism might hint at social or spiritual beliefs, perhaps a connection to totemic animals or clan identity. Tagliente Man lived during a period of profound transformation, ecologically, genetically and socially. As the Ice Age waned, new groups poured into the Italian peninsula from the Balkans, bearing fresh genetic lineages and new cultural traditions. He belonged to one of these groups, the Villa Bruna Cluster, whose genes would later become dominant across Europe. But his death, swift, bloody and territorial, reveals the cost of human migration 
and the tensions that brood in the tight corridors of Europe's rebounding wilderness. In death, Tagliente Man became more than an individual. He became a witness, his wounds a record, his DNA a signature, his bones a testimony. His is the earliest murder on Italian soil we can now reconstruct in detail, a man shaped by his lineage, his environment, and ultimately by the blade of another. As the last glacial maximum began to ease around 20,000 years ago, the icy grip that had covered vast swaths of Europe started to release its hold. This environmental shift triggered one of the most transformative periods in prehistoric human history, a time marked by the recolonization of deglaciated lands, the rise of new cultural traditions, and the spread of novel genetic lineages. At the heart of this transition stood the Epigravetian culture and its genetic counterpart, the Villa Bruna cluster, which together helped define the human landscape of Europe in the millennia that followed. The Epigravetian tradition emerged as a successor to the Gravetian culture around 24,000 years ago and persisted across southern and eastern Europe well into the early Holocene. It flourished in regions such as the Italian peninsula, the Balkans and eastern Europe, often occupying rock shelters and river valleys that had become accessible as glaciers retreated. Rather than a singular unified culture, the Epigravetian represents a flexible, evolving toolkit and symbolic tradition adopted by scattered bands of hunter-gatherers navigating a rapidly changing Ice Age world. These groups were expert hunters, particularly of red deer, ibex and reindeer, and were adept at exploiting a wide range of resources. Their toolkit reveals continuity with Gravetian blade and backed point technology, but also a move towards smaller, more adaptable microlithic tools. Flint projectile points, often finely retouched, indicate a growing reliance on distance weapons such as spears and perhaps even bows. The use of bone and antler for barbed points and harpoons also suggests a diversification of hunting methods. Epigravetian burials reflect the symbolic complexity of these societies. Individuals were often interred with grave goods such as ochre, decorated stones, flint tools and personal ornaments made of shells and animal teeth. Engraved art, sometimes depicting animals or abstract figures, suggests continuity with earlier Upper Paleolithic spiritual and aesthetic traditions, but also localised expressions unique to this period. Sites like Riparo Tagliente in northern Italy, Grotta Paglici in the south, and San Teodoro in Sicily demonstrate the wide geographic range of the Epigravetian and its adaptability to alpine, coastal and inland environments. These archaeological finds reveal that even in the cold and unstable world of the late Pleistocene, human culture was thriving, dynamic, and deeply embedded in both landscape and memory. The most profound transformation associated with the Epigravetian period came not just from technology or art, but from a sweeping genetic shift. Around 17,000 years ago, a new genetic lineage appears in the Italian peninsula, the Villa Bruna cluster, named after the Villa Bruna I skeleton found in northern Italy and dated to about 14,000 years ago. This lineage quickly spread across much of Europe, replacing or mixing with the earlier Gravetian-derived populations like the Vestonici cluster. Individuals such as Tagliente II, from Riparo Tagliente in Veneto, represent the earliest known instances of the Villa Bruna genetic profile in southern Europe. His genome, dated to around 17,000 years ago, exhibited strong affinities with populations from the Balkans. This suggests that the Villa Bruna cluster entered Europe from the southeast, following a corridor along the Adriatic coast or south of the Alps, as the glaciers retreated and new ecological zones opened. The spread of Villa Bruna ancestry was not gradual and local. It was rapid and expansive. Within just a few thousand years, this lineage would become the dominant genetic profile among European hunter-gatherers. Its characteristics included mitochondrial haplogroups such as U5 and the Y-chromosome haplogroup I2, both of which became prominent in Mesolithic and even some early Neolithic populations across Europe. The Villa Bruna genome also shows signs of reduced Neanderthal ancestry, suggesting either demographic dilution through interbreeding with newer modern human populations or selective pressures that purged archaic genes. 
Furthermore, this cluster marks one of the first appearances of certain pigmentation genes associated with lighter skin and eye color, though these traits were still variable and not yet fixed in the population. The convergence of the Epigravetian cultural tradition and the Villa Bruna genetic lineage was not coincidental. It represents the fusion of migration, adaptation, and environmental opportunity. As new groups moved into the Italian peninsula and beyond, they brought not only their DNA but also their knowledge, tools, and symbolic systems. While they inherited aspects of local Gravettian traditions, the innovations they introduced, especially in projectile technology and regional adaptation, reflect a distinct cultural identity. Moreover, the spread of Villabruna ancestry coincided with the emergence of major cultural and symbolic transitions in Western and Southern Europe. It is during this period that we see increasing evidence of artistic expression, complex burial rituals, and the domestication of the dog, a sign of changing human-animal relationships and possibly social structures. The Italian peninsula served as a crucial staging ground for this transformation. Northeastern Italy, in particular, appears to have been the entry point for the Villa Bruna genetic pulse, which then radiated westward into France, northward into the Alps, and eastward along the Danube. This migration not only reshaped the genetic makeup of Europe, but also helped knit together previously isolated populations into a more interconnected web of hunter-gatherer societies. By the time the Mesolithic dawned around 12,000 years ago, the Villa Bruna cluster had left a profound mark on the continent. Its descendants would interact with Western hunter-gatherer groups like the Oberkassel Cluster, blending their lineages and forming the basis of Europe's post-Ice Age populations. When Neolithic farmers eventually arrived from the Near East, it was these Villa Bruna descended hunter-gatherers who formed the genetic and cultural substrate of prehistoric Europe. The Epigravetian culture, meanwhile, serves as a vivid illustration of how human adaptability is expressed not only through tools and survival strategies, but also through art, burial and belief. Together, the Epigravetian and Villa Bruna cluster offer a window into a continent in transition, from cold to warmth, from isolation to expansion, and from one human population to another. This dynamic interplay of genetics and culture in the Epigravetian Villa Bruna Nexus, stands as one of the most important chapters in the story of how modern Europe came to be, not merely as a place, but as a tapestry of people, memory and legacy.